1940 Republican Convention. My brother and I went to sleep that night, Thursday, June 27th, while the radio was on in the living room. And our father and our mother and our older cousin Alvin sat listening together to the live coverage from Philadelphia. After six ballots, the Republicans still hadn't selected a candidate. Lindbergh's name was yet to be uttered by a single delegate, and because of an engineering conclave at a Midwestern factory where he'd been advertising, where he'd been advising on the design of a new fighter plane, he wasn't present or expected to be. When Sandy and I went to bed, the convention remained divided among Dewey, Wilkie, and two powerful Republican senators, Vanderburg of Michigan and Taft of Ohio. It didn't look as though a backroom deal was about to be broken any time soon by party bigwigs like former President Hoover, who'd been ousted from office by FDR's overwhelming 1932 victory, or by Governor Alf Landon, whom FDR defeated even more ignominiously four years later in the biggest landslide in history. Because it was the first muggy evening of summertime, the windows were open in every room, and Sandy and I couldn't help but continue to follow from bed the proceedings being aired out over our own living room. Being aired over our own living room. Radio and the radio playing in the flat downstairs. Since an alleyway only barely wide enough for a single car separated one house from the next. The radios of our neighbors to either side and across the way. As this was long before window air conditioners bested the noises of a neighborhood's tropical nights, the broadcast blanketed the block from Keir to Chancellor, a block on which not a single Republican lived in any of the thirty-odd two-and-a-half family houses or in the small new apartment buildings at the Chancellor Avenue corner, on the streets, on streets like ours, the Jews voted straight Democratic for as long as FDR was at the top of the ticket. But we were two kids and fell asleep despite everything and probably wouldn't have awakened till morning if not Lindbergh, with Republicans deadlocked in the 20th ballot, made his unanticipated entrance onto the convention floor at 3.18 a.m. The tall, lean, handsome hero, a lithe, athletic-looking man, not yet forty years old, arrived in his flying attire, having landed his own plane at the Philadelphia airport only minutes earlier, and at the sight of him, a surge of redemptive excitement brought the wilted con conventioneers up onto their feet to cry, Lindy, 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 for thirty glorious minutes, and without interruption from the chair, behind the successful ex execution of this spontaneous pseudo-religious drama, lay the machinations of Senator Gerald P. Nye of North Dakota, a right-wing isolationist who quickly placed in nomination the name of Charles A. Lindbergh of Little Falls, Minnesota, whereupon two of the most reactionary members of Congress, Congressman Thorkelson of Montana and Congressman Munt of South Dakota, seconded the nomination, and at precisely 4 a.m. on Friday, January 28th, or Friday, June 28th, the Republican Party, by acclamation, chose its candidate, the bigot who had denounced Jews over the airwaves to a national audience as other peoples, employing their enormous influence to lead our country to destruction, rather than truthfully acknowledging us to be a small minority of citizens, vastly outnumbered by our Christian countrymen, by and large obstructed by religious prejudice from attaining public power, and surely no less loyal to the principles of American democracy than an admirer of Adolf Hitler. And we will pause there.